Hello, Global Fact. Uh, hello, fact checkers of the world. I'm Lucas Graves, and I'll be moderating our conversation about uh, the elephant in the room, fact checking versus verification. Uh, it strikes me that that's a panel topic that wouldn't make any sense to anyone outside of the fact checking world. Uh, but fact checkers, members of the community, uh, know very well that there are these two very different strands that have developed uh, within the world of fact checking. Uh, checking things that politicians say and debunking fake news stories or doctored images uh, or phony rumors that circulate in the wild around the internet uh, can really be quite different uh, activities. Some organizations specialize in one or the other. Um, some do both, uh, but the landscape has really shifted in important ways since 2016 uh, when the world's hair went on fire about, uh, about the threat of fake news. Uh, and importantly, when Facebook started offering to partner uh, with fact checking organizations and to pay them to, uh, de you know, to identify and debunk fake news circulating on the social network so this raises really important questions for the community and we have a great panel to uh, talk about them and discuss them. Uh, I'll introduce them really briefly uh, and then let everyone introduce themselves. Uh, we have Giovanni Zagni, who's the head of, Polit of Pagella Politica uh, and of a new operation called Facta in Italy. Uh, he's the one who proposed this panel. So uh, we know that he has strong feelings about it uh, we've also got Katie Sanders, who's the managing editor at PolitiFact in the United States. We have Sophie Nicholson, who's the head of fact checking at uh, AFP, Agence France Presse, uh, based in Paris. And we have Fergus Bell, who's uh, the founder and CEO of Fathom, which is a kind of innovation lab that's worked with uh, fact checking projects uh, and especially collaborative fact checking projects uh, in the past. So to kick us off and start the discussion, uh, we'll go around once and uh, we'll have everyone introduce themselves and maybe give their opening thoughts uh, about what the important differences are, especially from a practical, practical perspective uh, between fact checking, political fact checking on the one hand and verification or debunking on the other. Uh, why does this matter? You know, what's the big deal? Uh, when you're doing this work, uh, how does it look different? Um, and I think we'll start uh, with, uh, with Giovanni. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, I'm Giovanni Mizzagni, and uh, I'm the director of Pagella Politica, uh, which is an Italian political fact-checking website when it started in 2012. And then in the past few years, uh, uh, specifically, we observed that the things that we were doing were beginning to shift, if not to change. And so in order to reflect this change, uh, we have launched this new uh, project, which is called uh, FACTA, that uh, deals only with uh, debunking and uh, uh, I would say non-political uh, disinformation. So. The thing I would like to say now is that I deeply, I'm really deeply convinced that there's a difference between, let's call them, political fact checking and debunking is real, is profound, and uh, from a practical perspective, it more or less touches on every uh, aspect of our work. Uh, for example, it has to do with the object of, of what we verify. We, a typical politician statement could be something like, and I took that from one of our last articles in the political section, thanks to our government today, there are 1.7 million families out of poverty in Italy. While on the other hand, one typical thing that we would like to verify in our debunking section is something like the woman in this photo gave birth to a child at the age of 54. Now, it is 
immediately evident that we are talking about two very different kind of uh, statements. But aside from the object, there is basically, uh, and I think that this is the more practical difference, there is a big, uh, big difference in the tools that you have to use in order to check these things. For example, if you have to check something around, I don't know, unemployment statistics or the number of families out of poverty, you have to use statistical databases, national, international, you have to contact experts in uh, economics uh, or in sociology. While on the other hand, if you have to debunk uh, 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 a, a viral photo that has been, that per shows something that is not what, 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 what is for real, then you have to use other tools, like more technical tools, like tools that have to do with the viral things that, that are on the internet. I don't know, like reverse image search or something like that. So, and I really think that you have to, uh, there are two very different trainings, two very different kind of expertise. And in the end, you're also talking to two different audiences. For example, if you check what a politician has said about a very specific thing, then you have, you, you are talking basically to people interested in politics or uh, people that are willing and able to engage uh, with a long and complex uh, uh, explanation about why this uh, statistics is bogus or this claim is incorrect or this, this claim is out of context. While on the other hand, if you have to deal with people that, uh, that uh, came in, in contact with the uh, uh, viral fake photos or videos or uh, absurd claims about, I don't know, uh, remedies against the virus, then you have to talk with a very different audience. Maybe an audience that is not, not interested in politics. Maybe an audience that is not so media savvy and could uh, give credit to the first uh, people that could be also skeptical of the fact that you are fact checking something that is non political and you have politics in your name or extremely evident or your, on your website, uh, which leads us in, in Italy to separate the, the, very clearly these two operations. Now, of course, one of, I'm, I'm really convinced that this distinction matters, but uh, in conclusion, it can be that these two words, these two fields overlap in some way, it happens from time to time, but it happens, in my opinion, uh, mainly in what we saw uh, recently in a, in a report by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, when, where they showed that basically some false claims out of the thousands and tens of thousands that are out there, some false claims get, get a lot of traction when they are spread by politicians or by major, or by major media. So I think then, aside from political fact-checking, so fact-checking statements that are part of the political discussion, when we are talking about debunking and verification, this is largely a non-political operation, one operation that can gain a lot from being separated from politics, and that uh, overlaps with politics only when uh, one of those political figures, which are, which are by themselves very visible, act as super spreaders of this false information. So that, that's basically my, my, my thinking on, on the issue. Thanks, Giovanni. So different claims, different tools, uh, different sources, and different audiences. Uh, you know, really, really different enterprises uh, altogether in your view. Uh, next, we'll hear from Katie Sanders uh, of PolitiFact. Hi, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I'm the managing editor of PolitiFact. I've been on the staff since 2012. And um, as I was thinking about this panel and the topic, I was thinking about, from our perspective, there is not so much an elephant in the room. <laughs> We have been merging these two worlds of political fact checking and verification debunking all along. And even more so than maybe I even realized when I was starting to prepare. So um, certainly since 2016, we've been doing a lot more of it, 
uh, primarily through partnership with the Facebook fact checking program. Um, where we've identified up upwards of 100 claims a month uh, that we've vetted through that were surfaced through that program. So we take it very seriously. But at the same time, we have our hands full with national, state and local fact checking across the country. And we think that actually there may be some differences with the tools um, from time to time with verifying a photo or um, dissecting a particularly dicey economic or historical claim. Um, but there's a lot more overlap in, in our experience uh, with the kind of politics we have going on. Um, so I was actually curious to see how much this had changed over the previous presidential cycles. And so I went all the way back to the web archive uh, for this week in 2008, and I expected to see a lot more just pure political fact checking in that year of all years. And what I found on the homepage was actually funny um, because it showed that we were doing debunking of, you know, absurd sounding things even then. Um, so I think on the homepage at that time, there were three chain email fact checks about Barack Obama, um, including one that um, I'm just going to torture you with a little bit, that he wanted to make the new national anthem. I'd like to... I forgot the name of the song. It's like, <laughs> I want to give the world a song to sing in perfect harmony, that one. Um, that was not true, of course. Um, and then I was like, well, what about 2012? Were, were we still doing typical straight fact checking then? And the main story on there was a Facebook graphic comparing Romney care and Obamacare. Um, in 2016, uh, there was a lot more tr kind of straight up political fact checking keeping candidates accountable. Um, but certainly now, if you go to our homepage, you'll see a ton more debunking. So I don't see it as something that we need to splinter off. I think that our journalists um, are, are capable of doing both. And we try to, the big challenge you wanted us to think about was with trying to do both is just choosing selection. Um, with so much to choose from, how do we prioritize what we're going to check on a daily basis? Thanks, Katie. That's really interesting. And, you know, we were hoping for some sharp disagreements right from the outset. Uh, so I know that we, we picked the right order. Um, <laughs> but I think that last point you make that, uh, you know, choosing what to check is a challenge. I mean, that's not an unimportant point, right, when it comes to setting priorities. Um, next, we'll hear from Sophie Nich Nicholson uh, uh, of Agence France Press. Uh, take it away. So yeah, I'm really pleased to be here too. I'm deputy head of fact checking at AFP. I work with a team of fact checkers across the globe. And we now have more than 80 people dedicated to fact checking in 14 languages. And one thing that has been constant in our work since we started writing fact checking articles in 2017 is a constant change. We're coming at this as a news organization adapting to the needs of a digital environment. AFP's fact-checking operations grew out of a team that was verifying videos and pictures from the public for use in news stories. But at the same time, we were also writing new formats for the Global Newswire, including political fact-checks. So uh, from, from our point of view, debunking and political fact-checking have developed together, and we see that as an advantage, as we see many overlaps more and more. And, and like Katie, I did look back too, and we, we, we really do have examples um, from, from way back where we were already looking at the banks because they were part of the debate. Um, and we see fundamental goals that, that, that are similar, like correcting the record or improving the quality of public discourse. Uh, on our teams, different journalists bring different skills to our investigations, like speaking Hindi or Polish or being a pro at open source investigations or being specialized in health or politics. And our approach to our fact checks is the same as we have in any investigation. We're really lucky that we have this network of journalists and they often check out information on the ground as well. Um, I thought it was really interesting what Eugene from factcheck.org said yesterday about their separate teams working more closely together on COVID related stories like pandemic. And I would say we're seeing an increasing overlap of political fact checking and debunks, particularly since, since COVID-19 broke out. Um, 
because a lot of the time the political speech is, is, is also appearing on Facebook and then, and then jumping into Facebook groups and, uh, and turning into memes and pictures and linked to the original speech. For example, when Donald Trump says he takes an unconfirmed drug that was promoted by a controversial French doctor backed by massive Facebook groups, a public speech simultaneously takes on a life on it, of its own in Facebook groups in the US, but it also keeps bubbling over in different versions in France or Africa. And the strength of our investigation is that we're looking at all these angles and we're cross-referencing. We try to identify and recognize these kinds of overlaps and we seek a deeper story in apparently basic debunks. We look for patterns of behavior among people who are sharing those kinds of posts. As we grow, the benefits of having local fact-checking teams within our own bureaus are really, really apparent. They help verify content around breaking news, but they also help identify online behavior that is increasingly having an impact in the real world. This is changing the way we work, and we're adapting to new ways of finding information and interacting with the public more. So uh, just to finish, it's, it's heartening to see a growing interest in what we're doing, both inside our own organization and, and outside. Because in, in the beginning, people used to, used to ask us what fact-checking was and, and, and say, don't you do that already, you're a news agency. And, and they thought we were fact-checking our own stories. And now it's, it's much more common, uh, gratifyingly, to, to hear people say, how can we work with you? And, and we, we're, we're interested in, in doing similar things or including that in in our stories. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, that's really interesting. And, uh, you know, I especially like the point that uh, you might be seeing more overlap when it comes to COVID related stories, when it comes to the infodemic. Uh, that's something that was highlighted in the uh, Reuters Institute report that, that Giovanni meant. And that raises the question of, you know, where exactly we see overlap and where we don't. And that's something we'll, uh, we'll talk about later. Uh, and lastly, in this introductory round, uh, we'll hear from Fergus Bell, who I think has a sort of maybe a thousand foot view or you know a 500 foot view of this landscape, having worked uh, with, uh, with fact checkers to set up, set up collaborations and to set up verification operations. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Lucas. Uh, I'm also, I have to put my hand up and say that I am a verifier. My background is in, in verification and, and I came to uh, this community through the, those kind of first people that were invited in as, as verifiers to, to perhaps share knowledge. Um, and I've learned a lot from the, the global fact community over the last few years. Um, I was really struck by something that Eric from Pacercheck said earlier today in, in a session, which was that we are all still acting like we won't be doing this forever. Um, and I thought that that was really a really important statement because it, it can dictate the way that we approach this. And uh, I agree with Sophie and Katie that we are starting to see a, a convergence. And the, these two disciplines or areas of, of our um, industry are coming together and, and have to come together more. Um, I think organizations can absolutely do both and should do both um, because we've seen an evolution in content and we've seen an evolution in, in the tools and the technologies and the types of stories that we cover. For example, we now have closed personal networks uh, that we didn't have uh, in the same capacity five, six, seven years ago. And with those private, personal, closed networks, whatever you want to call them, we have memes. And health misinformation is spreading as memes. Uh, it's spreading um, on, on closed networks. It's spreading in all kinds of places. And I think that in order to get on top of it, we have to learn from each other. So closed networks often have content that gets shared without context. Uh, and, and a meme is a good example of that. I was working on a, on a project for the Indian elections where we were tracking and trying to uh, analyze in order to verify memes that were political memes that were spreading. And we were seeing these combinations of 
claims and visual things that needed verifying, which required the expertise of a fact checker and a verifier, or actually um, someone who could do both. Now, I don't think we're going to see that going away because in places like India, in, in uh, places where there is not um, amazing cell phone coverage and bandwidth issues are, uh, are, are a major problem or, or languages are an issue, memes are going to be the way that we continue to see things being uh, spread and shared. And, and I would point out that political ads are also a combination of text and visual content. Um, we don't call it a meme, but we, we might, might see them being shared um, in the same ways. When we're talking about this combination of things, do we give it the priority? Do we give the image the priority, the claim a priority? If it's shared on a personal or private network, we have we don't necessarily know um, the intent with which it was shared. And so we have to come up with processes for dealing with that. We need new processes and new language for being able to debunk and fact check this kind of content, um, especially as well when we can't uh, attach those supplementary uh, information content, the, the information that is supplementary to it, which might be the long form fact check. We sometimes can't even share a link. And if we want to share a visual debunk or a visual fact check, um, it's we can't embed a link necessarily uh, as a live link in, in something like a uh, on WhatsApp. Um, I think also we're, we're moving into this place where we are working in a distributed setting. And it's given us an opportunity to rewrite the rule book about how organizations are, are set up. And so we should be thinking about this new approach, this converged approach, hand in hand with the current demands of our of our users. We have a global pandemic right now, um, and it's and we have a very complex presidential race in the US coming up. Both of those will push this question in, in a certain direction, and we need to we need to have the answer for that now before waiting for it to play out. I just wanted to, my last point is, is to really kind of come back to the, the point that Giovanni said at, at the beginning, which um, was that fact checkers and verifiers run very different operations. But I actually think that we need to learn from each other and say, you know, as a verifier, we don't have visual verification databases yet. You have visual, you have uh, fact check databases and the way that you have built those would be incredibly useful in the world of visual verification. Um, and I think what what the um, fact checkers can learn from the verifiers is how to deal with visual inf information and share it in the way that it, it has been shared uh, and gone viral in the first place. And so um, I think that there are ways that we can work together and, and I do think uh, that, it, it, that, that we need to be able to do two things at once. Thanks, Fergus. That's that's really helpful. And I think it, you know, all of your responses bring up the question of sort of how the field as a whole has shifted over the last several years. Um, there's been this incredible surge in resources available for verification and for debunking, uh, mainly from Facebook, you know, from the partnership program, I think, but perhaps also from other funders. You know, every, you know, government platform company, tech company, uh, since 2016 has suddenly become really interested uh, in, you know, uh, in how to how to identify and, and debunk fake news circulating online. Um, you know, what does that do to the balance of effort sort of in individual countries or even globally? You know, are we putting resources sort of where they uh, where they need to be placed? Um, I wonder what what perspective you you know you all have on this? Uh, I carried out a survey with Alexios Mansarlis, uh in 2018, which will be coming out as an article uh, uh, in a month or two. I hope um, the academic world moves slowly sometimes. But one of the really interesting features we found in that survey was that there's at least some evidence that some organizations were doing more debunking than would have been their preference. So there was you know, a bit of suggestive evidence that they were being pulled away from their core mission because debunking is where the resources are. Uh, now, maybe that's not a problem because you know, they can fund fact-checking with the debunking work, but I just wonder you know, how, how any of you see that. Is this a case of firefighters going where the fire is or do we have to worry about the overall balance? And I'd love to hear from anyone who 
who has feelings about that? Oh, I can go. Or, is that okay? Um, I, I can see how um, somebody might feel that way. Where if you're pursuing a debunking, you're not you're letting a political claim go from a politician. Um, you might be letting them off the hook. But I think you you kind of already said it, Lucas, which is that um, because of the resources, I, I think of it as um, boosting our ability to do more uh, political fact checking. You know, uh, we've been able to add staff, um, and I think that it's just been a huge plus for us. I don't see it as a burden, and I don't see it as letting people off the hook, um, particularly because we've continued to prioritize state partnerships who are checking their governors and um, top lawmakers. At the same time, we're doing this work. And even last year, which was a very busy year for verification and debunking, uh, we still managed to check each of the you know, 700 or so Democrats who ran for president at least once, <laughs> um, exaggerating a little bit. So um, I think as long as you identify the level that you're comfortable with, the goal that you want to have for um, keeping your politicians accountable, you should be able to do the debunking in tandem. Thanks, that's really interesting. Anyone else? I mean, we do hear, you know, we read lots of interesting articles with fact checkers saying they're overwhelmed. Uh, you know, is there is there too much to check? You know, is there stuff that's being neglected? Uh, Giovanni, and then Sophie. So, yeah, uh, I think that with the Facebook program, in my experience, uh, there is a kind of a big shift toward the verification uh, as opposed to political fact checking. And I would also add that in my experience, again, uh, this um, shift could also be a liability for us because our name is Pagella Politica, which means a uh, political spreadsheet, kind of uh, political notes, if you want. And uh, if you have, and it happened that, for example, an MP, uh, oh yeah, po uh, political report card, says Lucas. Um, so if you have to, uh, for example, th there was a, a, an instance where a, an MP asked uh, publicly, uh, why is there uh, uh, an organization that is called a uh, political report card and that have to do with the, and that targets the, the opposition or whatever, uh, that is uh, expressing itself on uh, fake, uh, um, fake videos or fake photos that do not have anything to do with politics. And now I can be, uh, I can have a very good answer to that, but I think that he has a point in the sense that if you are not, politics is a very uh, peculiar and difficult and uh, thorny field. And if you have to talk about politics, you have to adopt some uh, uh, guidances and some uh, measures that otherwise it's there is no sense in you taking if you're not talking about politics so i would say that there there was a shift there there is a shift and that also uh, and it would help if we uh, make a clear distinction uh, between the the two different things that that we do thanks Sophie, did you want to add to that yeah, no, I was going to say, I, I mean, from, from our point of view, but just more generally, I just see that it's uh, not really, I don't see the explosion in verification as taking away. I see it as a reaction to what's going on on, on on social networks and obviously under the Facebook program. And it's in so many ways just giving more in terms of giving opportunities to train people, giving opportunities to increase media literacy. Giving it, it, it in terms of serious uh, or fact checking organizations who focus just on the political fact checks, I, I don't see them not doing that anymore, but I see them doing that and, and cross referencing perhaps more. And for us, obviously, it, it's, it's an extension of, 
of journalism, but it's a positive thing to be working together, to collaborating with and within our teams, and then and then with people in other teams. There are obviously expert skills that some people have in in verification that go, you know, very sophisticated skills where we know we have to know who to call on in the same way that we have to know who to call on for a political story. But I I just don't see it as something that's taking away. Thank you. Um, if no one else has anything to add to that, we're already starting to get a lot of uh, questions from interested audience members uh, about how these choices are made in practice. So maybe I'll start with two from well-known uh, fact checkers. Uh, Peter asks, uh, given the need to prioritize, to choose between, uh, you know, between uh, fact checking, political fact checking and verification, you know, covering debates in parliament or covering fake news circulating online, what are the top criteria, what are the top three criteria that you would suggest uh, fact checkers use to make those choices? What criteria do you use? Uh, and relatedly, uh, Baybars uh, asks, isn't it the case that some fact checking organizations actually shy away from political fact checking because it's risky? And that's one reason that they focus on uh, more on debunking, which is, you know, less politically controversial. Is that an issue as, you know, as we think about this balance? And again, uh, we'll open it up. Uh, maybe you can sort of, you know, just nod or raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead, please, Fergus. Um, I think that this is a really in interesting question around prioritization. And it's something that uh, I spend a lot of time working on with, with fact-checking organizations, especially uh, those who are setting up new operations. And something that we do is tell them to always focus on your audience. And if you have a way of gauging uh, what your audience uh, is interested in, what they are sharing, what they, what they are requesting from you, tap into that. And then we start to think about uh, prioritization in terms of urgency. Is there a risk to life? Uh, is this timely? Is it already going viral? Is it already making an impact or causing harm? And then, you can get into more granular uh, prioritization. But I think in this case, it's a, if it's a claim or if it's a piece of visual verification to be, uh, to be addressed, you, can, you have to put that same level of prioritization on each. And if the claim is come what I'm most comfortable with or what you traditionally do. Thanks. Giovanni? Yeah, in, in our perspective, as it, Maybe is it already clear, but we choose like not to choose. So we set up two different newsrooms. Everyone has a different website. Everyone a different uh, uh, managing editor, and they both uh, choose what to to check. One is focused on uh, what politicians have said and what are, what is on the headlines in the newspapers that day, and the other one is focusing on what they are seeing in. Uh, in social media now, sometimes they 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 have something in common, and so we have a common Slack channel where we say, "Hey, uh, look at this. This is th there is this politician spreading this uh, viral hoax, but or on the other hand, there is these fake images that has a politician in it." But largely, I would say like 75, 80 percent of what they do is completely separate. So. In our, in our perspective, we decided kind of not to prioritize, but to divide it into two, two different parallel tracks that are more or less equal in strength and in terms of the size of the, of the, of the, of the team that is working on it. I have I just one, one thing to add. Um, I think that listening to your audience is key, so I, I don't need to re repeat that point, um, but we always prioritize reader, reader questions, and we get a lot of them. Um, and we also consider relevance. Um, is this statement about something in the news, whether it's from a politician or it's in a meme? Um, you know, is it worth looking into? Is it worth our time? Will anybody want to read it? That's another consideration. And then finally, um, does it sound wrong? Does it have a chance of being wrong or extremely nuanced? Um, I think what the the um, embrace of doing more debunking has done for our shop has helped us prioritize what information people are really seeing and sharing, um, whether it's a controversial CNN panel or an image or something that the president has shared. Um, that's 
for me, that's one of my operating questions. Can I ask a, a sort of lightning round follow-up before we get to the next audience questions? Um, you know, does any of you feel given the choice that, you know, checking a statement by the prime minister or the president or a congressional leader uh, is basically more important than going after the next viral rumor? I mean, is debunking always secondary or is that the wrong, wrong way to look at it? I mean, where are your instincts as, you know, as journalists or as uh, political analysts lead you? Uh, Sophie and then Giovanni. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's not one or the other. I do, I do feel there is a certain feeling that, that debunking is seen as somehow inferior and yet debunking can lead to like really in incredible investigations of you know, networks behind what's going on. But if you're not focusing on the little debunks, you're not really seeing that. And, and a lot of journalists were not really doing that until they got involved in this kind of stuff. Um, I think, yeah, there's, there's, obviously there, there has to be like close attention paid to what politicians are saying all the time. But we're always, I mean, I didn't, I didn't answer the last question, but we're always looking, when we're deciding what we're doing, we're deciding, is, is this having an impact somewhere as well? So that, that goes hand in hand. And then if it's having an impact and it's having an impact on social networks and then we're doing the debunk and then a lot of people are gonna see the debunk, that's, that seems more satisfactory because more people are gonna see the, the fact that that politician was fact-checked. Thanks. Giovanni? Yeah, just four words. Equally important, vastly different, might be. <laughs> Okay, that's a very clear message. Um, Sorry, so I'll just add. I know. Go ahead. Um, so for us, it's kind of a false choice. Again, um, some of the uh, debunking that we do is our most highly trafficked uh, stuff on the website, and it's always very surprising that there is so much interest in it, or that so many people are seeing it, but it often works out that way. So I think we learned the tough lesson from 2016, not to ignore things that sound like surely no one would believe them. We, we put a lot of weight and relevance on those claims now. I think we might need to move away from the phrase debunking and maybe call it visual verification and then it won't get such a bad, a bad rap. <laughs> is it, is it only, does debunking also cover kind of rumor checking and, you know, chain emails and that sort of thing? Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess it was inevitable that uh, the question of Facebook's policies for what and who can be fact-checked would come up. Uh, and Alice from Corrective uh, has, has led us there. Um, and she asks uh, whether the fact that Facebook doesn't allow its fact-checking partners to rate political speech, to check claims that you know Trump or Boris Johnson uh, uh, make, um, whether that affects the overall amount of fact checking or debunking, does it prevent you from doing, you know, uh, fact checks that you'd like to be doing on the platform? Um, and I would just add to that, do, you know, do you, does everyone basically wish that Facebook would let them, uh, check political claims? as part of the interface, as part of the program, instead of only on their own websites? Heads nodding, uh, please elaborate. I, I mean, I, I, I can just say speaking for, we, we, we work around the world and in every country we work in, that's if we, if we, if we start training someone to do fact checking and they're involved in the program, that's, that's the first question and that's a big frustration. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, no, sorry, I go on, but I, in terms of it, the way we work, it doesn't, it, of, of course, we're not going to not do a story because we can't rate it on Facebook. It doesn't influence what we're going to write because we're part of the program. In, in that respect, if it's a big news story, we're going to do the story regardless, and we're still going to have impact because we're still going to put it out as much as we can on social media and elsewhere so that people will see we've done it. But it is a big frustration. It would simplify things if you were able to just integrate them both through the platform. Katie? Well, it just seems to be the spirit of what the program 
is about too. It's about identifying false information on Facebook and not privileging who's sharing it, whether it's a user or a politician. So we've run into several instances where we've done a fact check of something the president or other candidates have said, and we see screenshots of it being shared all around um, across the platform. And it's frustrating not to attach that fact check to, um, so that people can see the correction. Um, but I have to say, when we see um, when we see ads on Facebook uh, that we know are not part of the program, we we really do take it upon ourselves to say we're fact checking it anyway, um, not just to make a point, but because we think it's important. Um, because we know for most users, they don't see that distinction the way Facebook does. So we want to do our best to provide um, factual information for them, you know, regardless of what they're seeing. Hmm, that's really interesting. Giovanni? Well, I think that, uh, no, it doesn't affect us in terms of what we do, but I also think that uh, political speech and political claims shouldn't be included in the in the program, uh, in Facebook's actual present program, because every time now with this gray overlay over false information, you are kind of uh, making a uh, super, uh, there is a pretty big intervention. And in my opinion, you have to limit that intervention to cases when the uh, information itself, the, the story in itself is completely, is either, okay, aside from harmful and violent and whatever, that gets removed and that's another question. But you have to be very careful in where you intervene because if you intervene in a in a political candidate, even if he's saying something that is outlandishly wrong, I think that you, as a fact checker, uh, have just too big a responsibility to uh, impede to the public to see what that politician have said. So now it it is kind of the. Uh, it is not, I think, uh, our mission to in any way uh, censor what a politician can or cannot say. And then it's up to the kind of the, of the uh, common discussion and the, uh, of the public forum, so to say, to decide that that politician have to be uh, listened to or not. But our scope, I think, when we are talking about uh, kind of acting on platforms uh, is has to be very limited, very careful, and in any way refrain us from being uh, perceived as some kind of arbiter of truth. Uh, so I, I'm 100% in for putting a, a gray overlay over something that is kind of invented, but I'm definitely not in for putting any kind of overlay over a politician statement. But sorry, can I can I just jump in? In, in, in? Just in terms of, I, I agree with 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 that part of that. But in terms of just putting a label, if it's an old video or that that kind of intervention, I mean, I, I think that the, the question of yeah taking something, having any impact on the post, that's one thing. But if it's just labeling the post, isn't that in the public interest? Uh, yeah, for sure, but. I'm, sp I'm, I'm kind of, a, I don't know, uh, philosophically, uh, philosophically, I, I'm 100% agree with you. But if you're talking about the, the current system on social media that gives fact checker to uh, reduce the spread of political speech and uh, uh, political claims made by public figures, uh, I don't agree that that have to be in any way limited or even censored. Now, of course, you have some extremes, like where it, it would be cool if that could happen, but still I think that we it is not worth to break that principle. If, if journalists are not the arbiters of truth, then, then who is? I mean, I, I understand the the concept of not um, distorting what someone is saying, but 
we should, as journalists, we should 100% be analyzing it and calling out mistruths if they're not there. Um, maybe, I'm mis maybe I'm misunderstanding the point, but, I, but we should absolutely be, be the ones to, to take on anything that is, that is spreading misinformation or is misinforming an audience. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but uh, it, so if you go to our website, you will have all the criticism that you want to the factual uh, truth of, of statements, but journalists, journalists and specifically fact checkers plus platforms, I think don't have to do that, that role. Yeah, that's a really uh, interesting argument, Giovanni. I mean, your, your point is that because the, the results of the fact checking on a platform lead to suppression of the speech, then the, the bar should be much higher for applying that to something a politician says than, some, than applying it to a random bit of, of fake news. Yeah, exactly. I, I think what Sophie said is true. We're not talking about overlay and equal suppression necessarily. Right now, there's nothing uh, for the worst of the worst kind of material that is shared by a politician. There's absolutely nothing. So I think there can be some middle ground if we were open to, you know, working it out and talking about other solutions. It doesn't have to be nothing to see here, false, you know, a shield. I think that you make a really good point, Giovanni, that people need to know um, what the politician is saying, but I think they also need to know it's wrong. Yeah, we could argue about but, Facebook all day, yeah. and that would be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we have a lot of other really uh, interesting audience questions in the queue, uh, including one from Noah at the Whistle, who asks something that that Katie sort of hinted at, um, which is, you know, what do audiences prefer? Is there do you see a pattern where either political fact checking or debunking has more traction? Uh, there's more demand for it. It spreads quicker. Well, I think that uh, there are a lot of people, um, I'll back up. I think that what Giovanni said at the opening about different audiences, some of that rings true, but I think that, um, you know, a lot of people, we're able to reach a lot of people who wouldn't ordinarily come to PolitiFact because they don't have an interest in political fact checks um, through this work. So. I think by the numbers, we're probably reaching more people through our um, verification and debunking. But um, our our truth squad, our you know loyal readers, are in it for the mission of you know really holding politicians accountable, especially. Um, and they 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 hold that very um, they're very grateful to us for for doing it. So. Um, I think that readers can be interested in both, particularly with matters of public health, like the coronavirus. Um, I'm trying to get to the answer I like, but basically I still think it's both. I don't think there has to be a trade-off. You know, I think there's no clean answer for what they prefer. And hopefully some people come for the uh, fake images, but stay, wind up staying for the, you know, meaty political fact checks. That's pretty optimistic, but yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> Fergus? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a really interesting question because I think we as an industry have a kind of inside baseball view of, of things. And, and the, the inside baseball view is that the audiences know the difference or care about the difference between fact checking and debunking. Um, and actually they want, they're, they're coming to us for the, the journalism and the right application of journalism, whatever that might may be. And I think if we start splitting it out in terms of separating them rather than just looking for the truth at that time or the analysis at that time, we could we could alienate the audience. Um, my, my opinion is that they they're coming to you for for what what you're able to provide rather than how you're labeling what you're doing. Giovanni, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I just have one uh, one bit of data that I think kind of pulls toward a specific interpretation for me. And that is that uh, before we we were this kind of, uh, our own page was kind of this hardcore uh, political fact-checking website. 
And uh, uh, we had, I would say, an equal amount of traffic, both uh, from debunking and from political fact checking. So uh, in answer to your last question, it was kind of 50-50 potentially. Uh, but then we, we saw that the bounce rate after we started to, to work on the Facebook program, so when the debunking um, operational rate really got going, the bounce rate was really super high, like 85%. So I think in my, my experience and from the little analysis that I did was that the people that came for verification didn't stay for the political fact check. When they saw that the homepage, they tended to close it because they weren't able to understand what we were doing with all these numbers and names of politicians and, and labels on them. So that was also kind of a little bit of a uh, piece of, of evidence that we inter interpreted toward the, the idea of going uh, toward a separation of the two. So uh, Martin from Spandeo Media asks uh, a difficult question. Um, given that the, you know, there's a difference between fact checking and verification, fact checking and verification on one hand and political fact checking uh, in practice, uh, can you use the same rating systems? You know, is the basic methodology the same? Uh, and maybe we can also consider, uh, you know, should different standards apply to those two kinds of work? Uh, do we need a separate code of principles? You know, the IFCN's code of principles was just revised after a lengthy, lengthy process that took a lot of effort. Um, but in fact, are these two kinds of work so separate that, you know, that different principles uh, should apply and should govern, you know, organizations when they do, when they do one or the other? Any thoughts about that? I I would just say, uh, coming uh, on the back of what Fergus said about people outside this this world, I, I think the idea of, of, of separating them is 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 a mistake. I, I, I totally recognize the differences, the different skills, and perhaps within the code of principles, there could be um, I, there could be separate sections that if there were organizations that only did verification or only only did political fact checking, they, they would only answer those specific questions. But fundamentally, I think that the majority of the questions, the majority of the the the, the aims of, of, of what we're doing, the quality that the investigative techniques are, are, are based on the same the same ideas. Okay, thanks. So that means that the same basic principles can apply in each in each case. I would when say I so, go yeah. and do sorry when I go and Please do sorry. um when I go and do verification and fact checking training with people, I use the code of principles as kind of guidance to take people through the whole process. I, I definitely see them as as aiding processes within organizations, regardless of what what discipline they are they are heading towards. Um, I think it's an incredibly useful resource for for anyone. Um, and the people who are doing verification will will find kind of the, the the opposing thing that's happened to the fact check is is that fact checking will encroach on their work and they'll have to have stand they'll have to adapt so I, I think that the, the two should should merge a lot more that's a really interesting point um, just picking up on that I mean is there since the standards really came out of the political fact checking world I think it's fair to say is there no tweak anybody would make to uh, allow them to apply more easily or fit better with verification? I mean, is there, there's no friction whatsoever? Giovanni? I think that the code of principles has uh, reflects the fact that it was, uh, it was first drafted when the, the, the focus of fact checking was very much on political fact checking and much less on verification. So if, for example, you look at the kind of the very first principle that is the one on non-partisanship and fairness when where you have actually to to demonstrate that you uh, are kind of equal to both sides of the political spectrum and uh, uh, so this focus specifically i think uh, is uh, particularly important if you work in political fact checking 
it could be much less relevant if your focus is on uh, on uh, on debunking and uh, for example uh, visual verification as Fergus uh, uh, said so yeah I think that it reflect it it is still valid I don't think it has to be overhauled or changed dramatically but I kind of understand it in its historical perspective to to use a boring expression thanks Giovanni um, I think we probably have time for one more question I'll put two out there really quickly uh, we have a question about how to tackle human rights violations uh, and hate speech that are behind information that's being shared and sometimes behind political ads um, are there particular approaches that you take to that uh, and secondly, maybe this relates to that, you know, if anyone wants to say any more about when and where debunking and political fact checking overlap when they get tangled up, you know, what kinds of controversies that would also be interesting. And again, the, the clock is ticking. So just a couple more comments for any of you. Uh, Fergus. On the on the human rights violations and hate speech, I, I think just to be really brief about that, I think speed, the speed of process, speed of prioritization, into, because that is key when it comes to to dealing with that. And especially on something like WhatsApp, uh, where there may be images or, or, or rumors going around, around around human rights violations or hate speech or violence, speed in getting a response out or a, a debunk or a fact check is, is crucial. That's really interesting. It suggests that speed is probably more important in verification in general than sometimes in political fact checking. Anyone else? On the hate speech um, question, I think that for us, when we want to fact check things that are surrounded by really problematic phrases or offensive language, we just have to be really clear on what we are fact checking and isolate that out and um, explain that, you know, we're not dealing with obviously um, hateful words or, you know, racist opinions. We're looking at the, the data that was presented. Um, if you're too kind of sloppy with what you're you know, copying and pasting and including the whole message, it sounds like you're rating, you're issuing a rating on whether that belief is true or not. So that's just what I would keep in mind, but I don't run into it all the time. That sort of circles us back to the question that, the question that came up just a second ago that nobody tackled directly. Does that mean that it might be useful to have different kinds of ratings for verification than for political fact checking? Like, you know, in a perfect world, would PolitiFact scale be different if it had been developed for, you know, for phony images and, and fake news? Um, I, I can't say I have thought about that before, um, but I have less heartburn about it now than I might have a few years ago. Um, and even then, it was a very mild case. <laughs> I think that our, our ratings um, have these definitions that include phrases like out of context or partially accurate, but not, you know, not telling the full story or um, leaving the wrong impression. So maybe they could sound a little bit more visual. Um, and we are working to make sure our rating definitions kind of square with the recommended video verification language. Um, we are working on that because that's a little bit newer to us. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for a really fascinating uh, discussion. I'm being told we, we have to wrap up, um, but this is a really important conversation uh, and I think it's been sort of overdue uh, and uh, and this was a, re a really great conversation. Uh, and uh, Bay Bars uh, Orsec is gonna come on now and talk a bit about the rest of the agenda for the day. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Feel free to email any of us with further questions uh, or with suggestions about where this conversation might go next. Thanks a lot.
I think that we uh, we lost Bay Bars because he didn't have audio, uh, but he uh, he'll come back very quickly uh, to uh, to talk about the following agenda. Here he is.